ladies, let's join in. Join in. Talk about life, faith, and beauty, and so much more. So let's empower each other and be informative. Yeah. So get inspired in every true queen, queen conversation. conversation. Hey all, and welcome back to Queen Conversations. This is episode number eight, and I am so excited about the guests that we have today. I mean, truly, truly inspired and excited uh, from the guests that we have today. And I don't want to waste any time. I want to dive right into the introduction of our guest today. Very special to me, very special to the community at large. The Reverend Leah D. Daltrey is a nationally recognized organizer activist political strategist, author, and faith leader. The daughter of a long line of community organizers and activists, Leah represents the fifth consecutive generations of pastors in the Daltrey family. A multifaceted leader with a gift for solving highly complex problems with remarkable speed and precision. Leah has a proven capacity to manage multi-billion dollar budgets and develop internal and external communication strategies. These abilities make her an in-demand consultant with invaluable expertise to organizations seeking exponential growth. She describes her ability to create calm out of chaos as a God-given gift, and everything she has accomplished is a reflection of that gift. Bishop Daughtry serves as the presiding prelay of the House of the Lord Churches, the fourth in secession. Standing at the intersection of faith and politics, she works with community activists and organizations, political entities, business and faith leaders, and communities to assist them in building coalitions and partnerships that advance the common good. For her work with and within communities of faith, Religion News Service named her one of the 12 most influential Democrats in the nation on faith and value politics. She has also served as resident fellow at Harvard University's Institute of Politics, where she focused on the role faith and values play in American politics. She is principal of On These Things LLC, which supports a broad array of businesses and organizations with strategic planning, project management, and community engagement activities. Daughtry previously served as Chief of Staff of the Democratic Party, as well as Chief Executive Officer for the 2008 and 2016 Democratic National Conventions, making her the first person in the Democratic Party history to hold the position twice. Daughtry is co-author along with Donna Brazil, Yolanda Carraway, and many more of the NAACP Image Award winning for For Colored Girls Who Consider Politics. In it, four of the most powerful African-American women in politics share the story of their friendship and how it has changed politics in America. Reverend Daughtry serves as an equity advisor for Sephora Incorporated and on the editorial board for the Global Women's Forum. She is founder and co-convener of Power Rising, which supports Black women in leveraging their economic, social, and political power. She sits on the board of directors of the National Council of Negro Women, Higher Heights for America, and the Samuel Dewitt Proctor Conference. And she is co-founder and co-chair of the Black Church PAC and co-chair of the Connections Committee of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Psi Zeta Omega Chapter, a graduate of Dartmouth College and Wesley Theological Seminary, Daughtry is a native of Brooklyn, New York. From pulpits to public forums to political platforms, in her own way, Leah Daughtry is an alchemist, an electrifying speaker full of power and charisma. She transforms corporate teams, congregations, and communities for the better. Beyond her amazing career, she's also a loving aunt, dedicated mentor, yarn addict, and avid shoe lover. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Queen Conversations, Reverend Leah Daughtry. So glad to have you. Thank you. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. 
Absolutely a pleasure. Uh, Reverend Leah, I, if, if that's okay for me to call you Reverend Leah. That's fine. Um, all right. Uh, we usually start Queen Conversations with something light and airy and fun um, called this or that. So I'm going to give you two things and you'll just pick one. Okay? okay. Whatever comes to your mind first. Okay. So domestic or international travel? International. Yes. What's your favorite place to visit? I love Paris. Yeah. I love South Africa, Ghana, Cuba, any of those. <laughs> any and everywhere. I love it. So working solo or working in a team? Team. Okay. Uh, city or country? City. Yes. Brooke, uh, it's, it's, it's a New York thing. Um, uh, music or podcast? Music. Okay. Wedges or stilettos? Are you a shoe fanatic? Stilettos. <laughs> That's not even a question. All the time. I hate wedges. I'm sorry. Um, and then everybody has to know Apple or Android? Android. Okay. 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 All right. All right. Reverend Lee, I'm so glad to have you on the uh, on the podcast today and uh, want to dive into the conversation. Um, your bio lays the foundation, speaks for itself, um, the incredible work that you've done and that you do. Um, but I want to understand how it is um, that you entered the realm of politics, public service, and ministry. Um, it, it, your bio indicated that it was a family foundation that kind of you saw that operating in your family. But I want to talk about your journey. Um, what Was that the catalyst or was there something else along the way? Well, uh, you're right. That was the catalyst. As uh, you heard in the bio, you, you read the whole bio. The, bio. the whole thing. I didn't really know that. <laughs> um, you know, I'm a fifth generation pastor. And so I grew up in a faith, a house of the faithful of the uh, observant of the of the devoted mm -hmm. and uh so you know church six days a week we didn't go on monday but we went every other day <laughs> but uh, i are uh and i'm pentecostal by tradition so that's just what Same we do. Here. go to church right <laughs> church. Church. Hey, morning sunday evening revival yes all of it wednesday, wednesday noonday prayer wednesday bible study thursday choir i mean the whole gamut right so yes what was different about us from other uh, Pentecostal congregations, at least in our city, was that we understood uh, our theological underpinnings mm -hmm. said that God was concerned about more than just our soul salvation and getting us to heaven. Mm -hmm. that God was concerned about the totality of our being while we are here on earth, you know, where we live, the conditions in which we live, food, air, water, safety, all of those things. Mm -hmm. So if that is the case, then how do we as Christians manifest that? Is it only through prayer and fasting and believing or are, are there uh, other ways, as James says, faith without works is dead. And so for mm -hmm. us, that meant an intimate involvement with the governmental systems around us, the political systems mm -hmm. that help to ensure that the abundant life that God promised to us was in fact uh, going to be manifested in our lifetimes through the systems that were happening all around us. So we were always politically active, always community engaged, and our church was really the hub and the center of activism in Brooklyn, New York, well, really in New York City. Uh, so I grew up with that understanding that the two were intertwined and that my engagement in the community, that my engagement in political activity was an outgrowth of my understanding of my faith. Mm -hmm. And that I could not divorce the two. I couldn't pray for people to be fed and then watch uh, the government take our tax dollars and not create food banks and not create mm -hmm. a supermarkets in the neighborhoods. The two went together. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's how really I started. So I never saw it as choosing, mm -hmm. but as the work that I do in politics and in community engagement to be an outgrowth of my faith. And that was from, you know, a kid. Uh, so there was, so it wasn't ever that I had to make a choice. They are all intertwined for me. 
That's amazing. So um, the intersection of faith and community is one that I believe that in some ways um, we've we've come to dissect them in some ways. Um, I also grew up in the Pentecostal tradition, but I found that um, in a lot of ways it was very insular, and in that you know we were praying inside the walls, but there wasn't um, too much outreach that pertained to other than, hey, have you accepted Christ? You know, those kinds of things. And so mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing to hear that that was your experience from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about some of the uh, some of the uh, challenges as it pertains to uh, occupying the space of ministry um, and then also occupying the space of uh public service, um, as we all well know, um, predominantly, uh, it's been very male dominated historically, both of those spaces. Um, what are some of the challenges that you think you have um, encountered along the way in those spaces? You know, I think um, one of the big challenges for me, because I grew up in this, in our church and in our community, uh, in a very egalitarian environment, right? So mm -hmm. in our church, women can and do hold every office. And it's always been like that since we were founded in 1929. So women have always been pastors. They've always been able to, be, in fact, our second presiding minister was a woman in 1952. Wow. So I grew up in this environment where I did not understand that there were limits on me because I was female. Mm -hmm. But when I left my church environment and went to college mm -hmm. and then went to work is when I encountered this, this, this idea that somehow because I was female, I couldn't do things and I was not supposed to act a certain, it's like, what, I don't even understand what that means. Right. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. So that was really an adjustment for me right? to make because I'd never encounter that, I, not in my house, not in my church, not in my community. Women did all the same things as men, or really for us, men did all the same things as women. There wasn't any difference right. for us. And so I had to adjust to environments where that wasn't the case. And that was hard to do. Mm -hmm, I can imagine. That was hard to do. Um, you know, and inside, in, in the political system, you know, the, in the Democratic Party, uh, in the formal structure of the Democratic Party, the DNC, we have rules that require every committee to be half women. Mm. Every you know set of appointments has to be, we call it equal division. There must be equal division. Um, so that's there in the party infrastructure. But then when you come to candidates, you mm -hmm. know, you still have the fight about getting women elected. The fact mm -hmm. of the matter is, you know, if if women were commend were in office commensurate with our numbers, then half of the U.S. Senate would be would be female. Mm -hmm. Half of the Congress would be female, and it's not. So we have a long way to go in this nation. And and talking about uh, women's empowerment and black women's empowerment, black people's empowerment mm -hmm. is always. Um, a challenge that you have and, and, and that you have to uh, navigate. Right. So one of the things that um, I think uh, you alluded to in, in this response is that um, representation. Why, why is representation important? Why is it important for uh, constituents to see um, legislators, um, presidents, uh, Supreme Court justices, um, and then also uh, young ladies that aspire to ministry, women that are bishops and elders and deacons. And why is it why is representation important in, in your in your opinion? Why does it matter if the person looks like me or thinks like me? Mm -hmm. So I think there's two two levels to that. First, there is the, the visual uh, what we see, the images that we see when we see people who look like us, whether that is my nephew seeing black men holding authority and leading something, whether it is my Asian congregation members seeing people who look like them. It is the visual for our young people and for our old people to say, 
they did it. I can do it. I have something to aspire to. Mm -hmm. uh, there is space for me in this place. And that is particularly important in America, mm -hmm. which is a land that has not, you know, that still struggles around race, that still struggles around it, ensuring that every one of our people feels that they belong here that there is room for them, that there are issues of equity and equality. So having imagery that reinforces the idea that everyone is welcome is really important, not just for us old people, but for the young ones who are coming up to say, oh, okay, when I was a little girl, the big thing was having black newscasters because we, we didn't have black newscasters when I was growing up. And then we got in, in New York, we got Sue Simmons. And it was like, oh, there's a black woman on TV. And my grandparents, whenever somebody black would come in, they go, they yell your name and you come running. What's the matter now? There's a black girl on TV. There's a black man on TV. And the Wheel of Fortune. There's a black man on Wheel of Fortune. Absolutely. Because we just didn't see it that often. Mm -hmm. And so seeing that was an affirmation of value and of worth. So they're the images that are a part of it. But then more than that, there's the substance. There's the understanding that there is someone who has had a similar experience to me, mm -hmm. who knows what it's like to, to suffer the microaggressions, mm -hmm. um, who, know, who has had the experience of not being able to get a taxi or a taxi not wanting to take you where you want to go, mm -hmm. or a bank officer who won't give you a loan, or where your, your house is appraised lower, mm -hmm. who you know is in those rooms saying, this has happened to me, so mm -hmm. we need to, let me make the rest of you aware that it's happened, mm -hmm. and let's come up with remedies so that all of us are treated equally. And so having a diverse array of experiences in a room where power is being wielded, where resources are being allocated, mm -hmm. is important. If you don't, and and that goes for race and gender, but really experiences. Period. If you are, uh, for example, when I was in the Clinton administration and they were doing uh, the welfare to work law passed, mm -hmm. I was in the labor department. I was chief of staff at the labor department, and they were writing the regulations. So the people who were writing the regulations were a bunch of uh, white people. They had the best intention, mm -hmm. a bunch of white people who lived in urban areas. They had grown up in urban areas. And so their definition of transportation was the bus and the train and that everyone has equal access to public transportation, bus or train to get to work. Well, for people who live in not non-urban areas, where there is no public transportation, the regulations did not suit them, did not fit their situation, and actually were impossible mm -hmm. for families living in a suburb to adhere to the rules around transportation. And they needed cars mm -hmm. to get to work. Not having someone in the room Mm -hmm. who had grown up in a suburb, worked in a suburb, understood what it's like to navigate childcare and mm -hmm. get to work in a suburb where there is no public transportation. Right. Made that the law was at a deficit mm -hmm. and was not applicable to everybody. So in that room needed some diversity of experience. Uh -huh. That makes sense. Having diversity of experience is critical to us having a government, a business, a church, that works for us. That is that is that is powerful, um, because also what I found um, in, in speaking of uh, of gender and race, um, people have a tendency to believe that that's a homogenous experience, right? That we are all the same, which we aren't. We aren't all the same. A very diverse, very very diverse group within a group. Um, so that's amazing that you said that also along the lines of representation um, is mentorship. Um, I, I listened to a, a, a interview that you did before and uh, you were talking about the fact that mentorship, um, what we what we strive to have in mentorship is really uh, someone in a place where we're going and that doesn't always look like what we look like. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was you, you, you made the statement that um, some of my mentors didn't look like me because they occupied spaces that I was going that no one like me 
had gone before. I want to talk about the importance of uh, mentorship in the ministry vein, uh, public service vein, um, how important that is, um, and then um, what we should really be striving for in mentorship, um, both as the mentee and the one that's doing the mentor. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a, that's a really good question. Um, so as a mentee, what you're looking for is someone who will support you, guide you, listen, give you real feedback. Um, and you may have several mentors. It may be someone who's in ministry, who has been where you are going or who is where you aspire to be. And that can be in business too. Uh, you may have a, a mentor or a coach or someone or, or, or a, uh, an advocate who will speak your name in a room of opportunity, mm -hmm. who will champion, who will champion you in a room that say, oh, I have somebody who can do that. Mm -hmm. who will mention you when in a room of opportunity. And that's really, really important. Um, but you want to, and for, for, you want a mentor who has the time to mentor you. Mm -hmm. That's true. Because in, in a, an authentic, real, powerful, uh, helpful mentorship is someone that you're going to have contact with. And I don't mean, you know, uh, once a week at 12 o'clock on Thursdays, but right. who you will be able to have real access to who you who is willing to give their time um, and who is willing to give you the feedback that you need uh, as you are growing and developing. Um, and listen, and mentors sometimes just give you a different perspective of things. And so sometimes the mentor is not older than you. Sometimes you got to have a mentor who's younger than you. That's true. Who understands, you know, different different thing who can expose you to a different way of thinking or different perspective. As a mentee, you also you want to come to the mentoring conversation with clarity mm -hmm. about what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. The worst thing is when I sit with someone and they just, they don't have no questions. They don't have any <laughs> direction. They just want to sit and have coffee. I don't have time for that. That's good. Coming, then come with some questions. Come That's with a specific thing. Come with how I can help you. Um, you know, over time, people who have started as my mentee are now my friends. They're my daughters. They can come to my house and sit and not say anything, or we can talk about the weather or what happened on the TV show. But in the beginning, it's like, what do you want? Right. Tell me how to tell me how to help you. Right. And then you can you we can grow a relationship. And ideally, you want a relationship that grows over with you over time. Mm -hmm. What my mentor, my key mentor, I've been we've been she's been my mentor. And now she's my friend for 30 years. And I still call her when I'm trying to make a decision about mm -hmm. something. But we also I see her at holidays. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a relationship that has grown. So there are responsibilities on both sides. If you're going to mentor someone, then may, if you're going to make the commitment, make the commitment. Mm -hmm. Be true to the commitment. Be consistent. Be available. And if you can't do it, if your deck is for, then say no. It's okay to say no. It's okay to say no. And maybe you can have one conversation to point someone in the right direction, but you don't have time for an ongoing relationship. Be transparent about that. Yeah. So that the person that you are engaging with knows what to expect. Set your limits and your boundaries so everybody is clear going into the relationship mm -hmm. what this is going to look like. And it can grow and change, but be clear in the beginning what you hope. And then as a mentor, what do you want to learn from your mentee? That's great. That's great. I think I think that's that's major because I think a lot of people do approach people um, and say, yeah, I want you to mentor me. But it's just like I just want you to pour, pour, pour. And it's like, well, I don't really know what you need. And 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 we have to be very specific in that. And then also on the other end, um, I, I greatly appreciate that advice. And I think that makes but I'll also tell you uh, to be uh, when people, young people or whoever middle come and say, I'd like you to be my mentor. I say no, because that sounds like work. I don't know you. <laughs> I don't know anything about you. And in our first conversation, you ask me to be a mentor, that's going to get you a no. Yeah. But if you say, I would like to have, can I buy you coffee? 
I'd like to sit with you for 30 minutes and just pick your brain about how I can grow as a pastor. Mm -hmm. Or I'd like to talk to you about the ways that I can foundation my business to make it successful. I am clear that it's 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's coffee, not dinner, because I don't know you. Mm -hmm. It's coffee. It's a 30 minute conversation and I'm clear about what your objective is. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. after that, we may agree to meet again. Right. We may agree to have lunch. We may agree to have dinner, but I'm clear at the beginning and I won't say no to a cup of coffee with a clear objective. But hi, my name is, is you know, Sally Jones. It's so nice to meet you. Will you be my mentor? Oh, no, that's going to get you a no. Real quick, because <laughs> I don't know you. And most people, you have to establish that rapport first. It makes exactly, sense. exactly. It makes sense. And really, you don't know me either, right? And I may or may not be the type of person you want to mentor you, right? You know, if if you're asking me on first glance, it's because you've read something about me or you heard something about, but you really, so <laughs> a cup of coffee, right? Or meeting for tea mm -hmm. uh, is is a good way to uh, break the ice and kind of get to know one another and. Then you can go from there. It makes sense. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to talk about uh, this amazing project you've been a part of for color girls who have considered politics um, with a group of amazing women that you call friends. I want to know what that experience was like writing, um, collaborating, and really the goal and intent behind the book, which I have. And I think it's amazing. Well, you know, we've been uh, Donna Brazil, Yolanda Caraway, Mignon Moore, and I um, decided to write this book. It actually started as an HBO miniseries. Hmm. Not a miniseries, HBO series. And um, we had a showrunner, we signed contracts, and it went into development. And as we were getting the scripts back, we weren't really comfortable with the scripts. We had questions. It, it was not a bio pick. It was, you know, based on. And so there were lots of, it's HBO, lots right. of liberties and <laughs> imagination and creativity. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and quite honestly, I mean, some of it we weren't comfortable with and we weren't sure about the direction of the characters. And I particularly had, um, you know, I'm a pastor. So some things just were problematic for me. And even though it wasn't me, it was me. And I said, I'm going, y'all going to try to get me up before the mother's board and the elder's board. About I'm not trying to go here. <laughs> and I'm not trying to, I have lived my whole life without going before the elder's board. So I really would not like to do it right, right now. Uh, but we showed the script to one of our dear brother friends and he read it and he said, no. Yeah. No, this the for the work that you all have spent your lives doing, people's introductions to the colored girl shouldn't be this HBO uh, series. Mm -hmm. It should be the, the story that you want to tell. And so we set about writing this book because we wanted to control the narrative. Mm -hmm. We wanted to tell our stories in our voice. Now, what happens after that? But at least committed to paper for all times as this manuscript. So we set about writing. We had a wonderful writing partner, Veronica Chambers, mm -hmm. who took all of our stories and weaved them into a whole. She is fantastic. I think she's working. She's with the New York Times now. She's living in London, but she's a noted biographer. She did Marcus Samuelson's uh, The Chef, his book. Mm -hmm. She's got so many best-selling books on her own and the ones that she writes with others. We were very fortunate to have her work with us. Um, and so she, you know, we, I write, so I wrote some of my story. Yolanda wrote some of hers, Mignon Dick, and then Veronica just, God bless her, wove, wove it all together, which was, you know, the hardest job in the world to take out four voices and stories and make them all make sense. So it, it took a while. Because we're a we're busy, and mm -hmm. b trying to weave it all together was a challenge, and but it got done, and I think in the end, it's it's what we wanted it to be. 
That's fantastic. It's it's definitely worth it was definitely worth it for me <laughs> on the side of it. Um I I I um I also want to speak to uh not that just that particular work, but also uh Power Rising, uh, which is a conference that you are a convener on. And I had the opportunity to kind of in between work get into some of those sessions of the most recent um event that you had. Can you talk about power rising? Um the 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 goal and objective behind it. And um, I just want to hear a little bit more behind it. it, it it's amazing. Um, so excellently done. Um, but if you could talk about it a little bit, I'm um, all about, about women's empowerment, obviously, but the queen. Absolutely. You know, we started Power Rising after the 2016 elections when Hillary Clinton lost and she had received 94% of black women's votes. Um, and so we were angry that she lost but we were also uh, trying to figure out what we do with this, with the fact that 94% of black women's vote went to Hillary Clinton and that we were exercising political power in unimagined, unprecedented ways. Black women are the largest, most consistent voting bloc in the nation. We outperform every single demographic in the country. Mm -hmm. And so what do we do with that? So we began planning a gathering and we were at a, a retreat of the Congressional Black Caucus mm -hmm. women. And uh, Congresswoman Waters said, so Leah, what should we do now? We've passed this election. What, what should we do now? I said, well, if I had a magic wand, I'd convene a conference for Black women to talk about what we do now. Mm -hmm. And she said, let's do it. And so we began planning. And so we held the first uh, power rising in 2018 mm -hmm. uh, in Atlanta. Uh, and we really didn't know what to expect. Um, and, you know, we wound up with 1,500 Black women from 40 states in the wow. country. And they were of all ages. Mm -hmm. uh, women, and one of the things we love about Power Rising is that women bring their mothers. Yeah. Uh, women bring their daughters. Uh, and it's it's black women being black women in all the ways that you can be black women. They are young, they are old, there are babies, they are gay, they're straight, they're religious, they're not religious, whatever. If you call yourself a black woman, power rising is for you. And Love the it. point is to really acknowledge our power. Mm -hmm. And it was Tr Reverend Tracy Blackman that helped mm -hmm. define our name. Because we often talk about speaking truth to power. Yes. But what about power speaking truth? Mm -hmm. what, if, what, if, what if we reimagine that and understand ourselves as powerful mm -hmm. and what we do with that power? So we organize our conferences around five pillars, business and economic empowerment, culture and community, education and innovation, health and wellness, and political empowerment. And to teach women, to give them the tools, to expose them to new ideas around how they can be personally empowered, but mm -hmm. also how they collaborate with others in their community mm -hmm. and in their nation to leverage their power to move communities forward. Uh, so it's uh, all black women, all the speakers are black women. We don't allow any men to speak. Uh, actually, we have one honorary man every year. We have one man. So the first year, B.B. Winans was the Sunday <laughs> singer. Uh, and the, uh, then we went to New Orleans in 2019, and Congressman Cedric Richmond, okay. who's now in the White House, he was it was his district. So mm -hmm. he was our host, and we let him speak. But other than that, it's about Black women, finding Black women from a diversity of places, spaces, and experiences, giving them the stage, helping sisters to see themselves, uh, learn new things, make new friends, and you know, go back home empowered and ready to do work. And it's just one of the most um, empowering things I've ever been a part of. Mm -hmm. That first year, women came not because they knew anybody who was going to be there. Mm -hmm. But because they said black women are meeting and I want to come, mm -hmm. women came by them. So, you know, you usually go with your girls. They didn't people didn't go with their girls. They just showed up yeah. and said, I'm going to see what this is. Mm -hmm. And there was Cicely Tyson and there was Nicole. There was there were all of these people. Mm -hmm. And it's very and I, I want you to come. We're going to be live again next mm -hmm. year. 
Um, go to powerrising.org and make sure you get yourself on the mailing list. But in the mm -hmm. meantime, we've been virtual. So yeah. you can kind of get the experience of what Power Rising is. And, uh, it's, and it's a great time. We have spontaneous dance parties and, you know, and you just come and you just be. You want to yeah. wear your pajamas to the ball and wear your pajamas, girl. You <laughs> throw in your stilettos and do that. You want a full face, fine. You want no makeup, fine. Whatever you want to do is black women loving on black women uh, oh. and giving each other the strength to move forward. Yeah. First of all, we need more spaces like that, safe spaces, right? Um, from, from criticism from so many different angles. Um, but secondly, I'm going to be there next time. Um, and, and thirdly, I love what it does to kind of dispel some of the myths that we can't come together, that we, we are constantly in competition with each other and that, you know, we, we can't get along. And I absolutely love what it does for that specifically. And, and one of the key things for us is that it's egalitarian. So we don't do reserved seating. Mm -hmm. Get there. You don't know who you're going to be sitting next to. You might be sitting next to a college president or a, a hospital president or a CEO, but the doors open, you go in, you find a seat, and the only people we serve, serve safe seats for are the mamas. Mm -hmm. We give them a tiara, they get front row seats, and they have a great time. But other than that, it's just we don't do the whole VIP and Love we're it. more important than it is like we are all in here, black women together, mm -hmm. and, and we don't love on each other this weekend. I love it. So I want to really quick talk about um, how how the pandemic has impacted the work. I know you said Power Rising has gone virtual uh, for this year, but coming back in person. Um, how has it impacted the work that you do um, uh, day in and day out? You, you know, you, you learn new ways of being mm -hmm. and doing that. I, you know, look, I had already used Zoom before the pandemic. Yeah. But, you know, Zoom became the way to do things. Yeah. So I think it's had its ups and downs. I think for church, for church world, it's forced us to understand ministry in a new way. Mm -hmm. uh, and to really, as, as I have termed it, we had to tear down the idols of our buildings mm. because we had become so wed and so attached to the building That's that we good. almost didn't know how to have church outside of the building. And so I think it was a time for us to say, to realize that we made our buildings and our campuses into idols. Mm -hmm. And so can we do, we had to learn how to do ministry outside of the four walls of our temples, cathedrals, churches, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Now the caution is as we're going back, let's not have the internet become the next new idol, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, so I think for church, so that, that, that's that been good for us in our <laughs> organization our churches have grown we've got new members mm -hmm. from all over and that's mm -hmm. so it's been good for us and it forced us to learn new skills and use new technology that we probably would have spent the next three four five years trying to learn how to use mm -hmm. i think in regular life it's done a couple of things one is stretched us all of us to learn new skills mm -hmm. to learn new ways of working to learn how to um how to interact differently in a, that we would not have done if the pandemic had come. Mm -hmm. But on the downside, uh, I think some of us, we, you know, we worked ourselves into exhaustion. True. Some people are more tired now than they've ever been because the Zooms never stop. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but we, we've come to be able to name mental illness mm -hmm. and mental fatigue in a way that we weren't able to before, mm -hmm. but the drawing of boundaries, boundaries have been nearly erased. I think we're starting to draw them back now. And that's mm -hmm. been a challenge because when everybody's electronic, then, you know, clients, bosses, they're like, sure, it's eight o'clock on Saturday, but can you just jump on this Zoom? No, yeah, yeah. I would have never asked you that in the old days. Yeah. Yeah. But now it's, 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 it's normal and we've got to uh, get out of that habit. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think overall, we we all learn something about ourselves. Definitely. In this pandemic, uh, we might not. Some of us had to learn how to be by ourselves mm, in this true. pandemic. Be with our husbands and our wives. This is the most time we spend with our husbands and our wives ever. <laughs> um, especially in those early days when you could not go out. <laughs> and you're like, who did I? Who here? <laughs> who is this here? 
Who is this here? So I think we learned, yes. we learned. We and if you didn't learn anything about yourself in the pandemic, yeah, I we need to have a conversation. Big question marks everywhere. Because <laughs> I think we all learned something. Truly. Truly. So I asked you about the challenges earlier. I want to talk about the joys. What are the joys of the work that you do? What what makes you proud that, hey, this was the this is the path. I knew I knew this is the path, even though there was resistance. You know, I get a lot of joy um when I see Kamala Harris. Yeah. Every day because she's, you know, the realization of so many dreams. Mm -hmm. And whether you agree with everything she says or does or not. The fact is there's a black woman in the White House. There you go. Never happened before. Never happened before. And we should take joy. We should be happy. We got somebody to criticize. Right? Uh, you know, we got somebody or got somebody to love on. I think that is yeah. that's yeah. joyful for me to see so many black women in leadership these days. Mm -hmm. When I was when we were starting out, the girls and I, there weren't a lot of black women. Mm -hmm. around. I mean, I think there were maybe five or six women in Congress. They're now 30 um, Black women. So it's seeing so many Black women in every sector. Mm -hmm. Every sector. Business, educate. There's a Black woman who's leading. And yeah. that's really, really inspiring. And then more personally, seeing my mentees, the women, the young women who uh, have been part of my life and part of my circle, part of my mentoring circles to see them flourish and see their careers take off. It's just, I get such joy, such joy out of them. One of them uh, texted me yesterday. She's now pregnant. And so oh. she's like, get ready to just get, uh, expand your auntie portfolio. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, another baby. That's so, great. you know, those sorts of personal joys and her career is great. And that just gives me all the smiles and all the happiness and makes me say, I, when I see them succeed, I did something Absolutely. right somewhere. Absolutely. I always say, if you're living for yourself, you're not living at all. So the fact that your testimony is that I'm grateful to have been a blessing to somebody else is amazing. Um, I, as, as we begin to wrap up the conversation, um, I would like you to give any uh, words of advice, parting words, for someone who is currently in and or expiring to uh, politics, public service, ministry, um, any words of advice that you might be able to share would be fantastic. Well, I'd start with this. Be clear about why you want to do the work you want to do. And it doesn't have to all look the same as everybody else, but you better be clear mm -hmm. about why you're doing what you're doing, why you are pursuing what you're pursuing. And mm -hmm. your answer may be because I think it makes a lot of money and it's important. And as, as one young woman told me one day, I want to be a household name. She didn't care how she got there. She just want to be a household name. It's like, okay. Oh, okay go ahead. Listen, if that's your aspiration, that's not one I can help you with, but that's your aspiration. That's what she, she was clear about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, whatever it is you're aspiring to do, whether it's ministry, whether it's politics, whether it's government, business, whatever, why are you doing that? And keep that before you. Mm -hmm. Keep that before you. Now, I would encourage you to lead from your values mm -hmm. and to be clear about what your values are so that when the days come that you have to make decisions and you have to make choices about what you're going to do and what you're not going to do and where your boundaries are. You are clear about your values. What's driving you? Is it fairness? Is it equity? Is it equality? Is it camaraderie? Is it love? What is the reason? What is driving you? What's behind? Mm -hmm. What's behind your career? What's behind your desire? Because there's going to come a day when you're going to have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. You're sitting in a room and you're going to have to decide about a thing, a person, mm -hmm. an opportunity. If you're not clear on why you're doing what you're doing and what's driving you, you're going to be lost. Absolutely. And then lost people can't help nobody find themselves. That's it. So those are the those are the things that I would uh, ask you to um, consider. And the third thing is consider who's around you. Who's your team? Mm -hmm. You need a team. Everybody, the most successful people need a team. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And in my book, in the book, we talk, I talk about uh, some of the people you need, a coach, a cheerleader, are people that you need that will help you navigate uh, your future and your career and your life. Somebody mm-hmm. who's going to say, girl, don't wear that. Don't do that. What are you doing? Go sit down. Absolutely. You need somebody who's going to be your truth teller, who's going to be like, mm-hmm. That That's it. Not it. And somebody who's going to say, yes, you're the biggest, biggest thing since sliced bread. You can do it. You need that person as well. You, there's a set of people that you need around you who are going to be there for you and help you navigate uh, what can sometimes be a lonely path when you're yeah. pursuing a dream. Yeah. Great saged advice. Reverend Leah, I am better for having had this conversation. And I know uh, the folks that hear it will feel the same. Thank you so much for joining me on Queen Conversations. It has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And I wish you great success and and joy in the days ahead. Thank you. Come on, ladies. Let's join in. Join in my life, faith, and beauty. And so much more.